I uh, actually, I, I have a whole bunch of different stuff in mind. I, I've done Japan. You know, I did an interview about Japan. I've done a ton of radio interviews in the last um, 14 days. And um, most of them were about the Arab street revolutions. But uh, one of them was about Japan. You know, periodically, we do have natural disasters. The planet is rife with them. Uh, Mother Nature isn't nice. I mean, it says in the loser principle uh, in a chapter title, Mother Nature is a bloody bitch. And she is. And, and we've gone on at great length about how the nature worshippers among us who feel that if you go out and play, pray to a tulip um, or hug a tree, that Mother Nature is going to turn nice and kind and give us the Garden of Eden. are crazy because there never was a Garden of Eden. It's been catastrophe after catastrophe. The, the monstrous thing is that nature... Every single creature nature gives birth to is condemned to something right at birth. Sometimes it's going to happen. Sometimes in his life, it's called death. And nature works that way. And nature sort of uh, lets us accumulate the way that moss accumulates on a tree. You know that green sort of stuff that's uh, you can it can stay there if you wanted to. But if you want, you could just take something and scrape it off. Take a piece of of rock and scrape the stuff off. Well, nature periodically scrapes us off the face of the planet, not just us, but just about everything living. And she gets rid of individuals by the hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions, and sometimes by the billions of billions, and she doesn't give a shit as long as life continues. Because life is for her this great big throbbing mass. Life for her is this great big... Um, group project this huge group project and if individuals suffer in order to advance the cause of the group so be it nature doesn't care the the remarkable thing about us humans is that we do care the remarkable thing about us humans is that we care about individuals and where they stand in the shape of things and the more we develop individualism the, the smarter the whole life system gets the whole smarter the whole global brain gets and that includes algae and moss and fungus and bacteria and 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 rotmort and um, and and uh, shingles and everything else <laughs> gets smarter the more that consciousness gets added to the process and the more the yeastiness and feistiness of individualism gets asked to, added to the process so in the interview I was doing on Monday the interviewer who's somewhere in my age range I mean he's somewhere over the age of 50 said, and what do you think about the fact that the American population is getting older? And what do you think about the fact that people like Aubrey de Grey want to extend the lifespan of humans to 175 years? Isn't that mean there, doesn't that mean there's a bunch of old farts who are going to slow down the planet, um, who are going to dumb us all down, you know, with their senility and incapability of finding their, figuring out where they left their keys and what their house address is and what their name is and... Stuff like that. And I said, no, don't you realize, Dumbbell, the, the older we get, the smarter we get. The older we get, the more decades of experience we accumulate. The more we're able to look back and compare what was happening in the 1950s to what's happening in 2011. The more we've got all these astonishing new perspectives. And the older we get, the more we add of that individualism, that feistiness of individualism, and wanting to keep the individual alive and going, fuck death. Fuck death. Hear that, nature? Fuck death. The more we do that, the smarter this whole enterprise, which includes stones and bones and stars and trees, the smarter this whole thing is going to get. Because for 13, almost 14 billion years now, 13.73 billion years and ever since the Big Bang, this cosmos has been slowly getting itself a brain. And this absolute determination to defy nature in every conceivable way is making nature smarter nature is using us to reinvent herself but you've heard all of that from me before so enough of that rant um I mean, the stuff that I've been getting onto this week is is weird cosmic shit because in the last 24 hours like yesterday first of all I know we're gonna have a hard time connecting all that should be the name yesterday. of the next book by the way weird cosmic oh the shit. next book the, the next book the one that I'm working on now is called the God problem. I like weird but, cosmic shit better. Oh, okay. Well, well, okay. But at any rate, um, so you want to hear the title of the next book? It's The God Problem, The Five Heresies, or The Big Bang Tango, Quarking in the Social Cosmos, Notes for a Post-Newtonian Science. The book will be shorter than the title. Uh, <laughs> okay, so yesterday, first of all, about two months ago, three months ago, um, I got this 
Google alert. And this Google, I don't look at my Google alerts because the things that show up on Google uh, Google alerts about me are usually so trivial that it's not worth paying any attention to them. I, I tend to be one of the least known people on the planet. Almost nothing gets written about me that's for real. Um, so at any rate, but I, for some reason I decided to look at this particular Google alert and it turned out to be in something called the Collège Times. Now how can you take something seriously that's in something called the Collège Times? I mean, obviously, this was Google making another big mistake. And I, I read the first half of this giant article in the Collegiate Times, and it said nothing about me anywhere. And Google was obviously blowing it once again, as usual, which Google doesn't usually do. Google's the, like the best thing that ever happened in our lifetime, um, better than Wonder Bread. But at any rate, um, so I'm reading this thing, and then I get to the last half. And it turns out the Collegiate Time is this newspaper, this daily newspaper in Dubai. And this author in this daily newspaper in Dubai, remember, I am the resident Zionist atheist Jew on Iranian television. I am the devil incarnate in the Islamic world, right? 17 Islamic countries have put me on their punishment list for being supposedly anti-Islamic, right? So... In the Khalij Times, this writer is talking about this guy who understands the future of Dubai better than anybody else on the planet, and whose book you absolutely have to pay attention to. And it turns out it's a book called The Genius of the Beast. Well, I vaguely remember who wrote The Genius of the Beast. Didn't I work on that for about two years, well, seven years, actually? That's my book. What are they doing talking about me? Well, you get, to, I'm wondering who this bozo is in this obviously Looney Tunes publication called the Collegiate Times. And I get down to the bottom of the article, and it says that he is the head of a $33 billion business called Emma Realty in Dubai. Okay, that sounds pretty impressive. $33 billion? I mean, that's bigger than the gross domestic product of countries like Luxembourg and uh, Qatar. So um, I decided to look him up a little bit further. First of all, it says it, it wasn't just that he wrote this newspaper article. The newspaper article was a version of a speech he gave that morning, and he gave that speech to something called the Arab Business and Economic Forum. Well, the, the Arab Business and Economic Forum, doesn't that sound a lot like the World Economic Forum? Yeah, it turns out it's an offshoot of the World Economic Forum. In fact, it turns out that this guy is one of the co-founders of it. So you look around to see if you can find out any more on this guy, and it turns out there's a giant Wikipedia article on him. Giant. He's considered one of the five most prominent people in the Arab world. What? I mean, you know, bigger than Muammar Gaddafi, um, bigger, bigger than Mubarak. Um, give me a break. How could that possibly be? Well, it turns out that he's the former minister of development for Dubai. And in addition to that, um, he is the senior aide to the sheikh who runs Dubai, and the sheikh who runs Dubai also happens to be the prime minister of the United Arab Emirates, one of those little groups as part of the Gulf Cooperation Council that just sent 2,000 soldiers into Bahrain. Okay, so this is an important guy, and he's telling, and in front of this thing called the Arab Business and Economic Forum, he is telling all of these leaders from all over the Arab world the future of your economies is in this book by a guy named Howard Bloom. If only he understood who I am. <laughs> you know, Zionist, atheist, Jew. It's a little wacky and weird here. So um, finally, one of my fans, I have fans in the Islamic world because they don't think I'm anti-Islamic. They think what I'm trying to do is bell the cat. They think that what I'm trying to do is show you the danger of the militant side of Islam. And that's the, that's the side of Islam that tends to crush them, that makes it impossible for them to speak up that wants to slit their throats. That's the part of Islam that passes anti-blasphemy laws. Um, that's the part of Islam that turns people into a hero, like the guy who shot with 38 bullets in uh, a, a secular-leaning governor in Pakistan a couple of months ago, and the people who burned down a church in Indonesia a couple of weeks ago and beat three people to death on the assumption that they might be Christians. Um, I mean, this stuff is not just dangerous to these people. We couldn't have an amazing atheist in Pakistan. You'd be under a death sentence, TJ. I mean, there are 4,000 people who've been accused of blasphemy, and the, 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 the sentence for blasphemy, being convicted of blasphemy, is death. And my friends in places like Pakistan who are secular, modern, liberal, pluralist, wonderful, fantastic, delightful human beings are not allowed to be wonderful, fantastic, pluralist, secular, 
atheist or any of this stuff. Because if they open their mouths, blam, it's the end of them. And it's the militants who are putting their thumb down on these people. So the, there are people in the Islamic world who are actually big fans of mine and are very grateful that I'm writing about the darker side of Islam, which is pretty weird. But at any rate, no, I mean, not that the darker side of Islam is pretty weird, and it is. It's that <laughs> it's pretty weird that there are a lot of people in the Islamic world who seems to like me. Okay, so one of the people who seems to like me has just moved to Dubai. And um, he said, is there anything I can do for you in Dubai? I said, well, can you get hold of this guy named uh, Muhammad Alibar, who wrote me up in the Khalij Times, because I'd love to meet him when he's in New York sometime. So he got me the email address of Muhammad Alibar two days ago, and I wrote to Muhammad Alibar, the former Minister of Development for Dubai and the senior minister to um, the Sheikh of Dubai, who, by the way, in his article mentioned that he had given a copy of The Genius of the Beast to the Sheikh of Dubai and said, you have to read this for policy reasons if you're going to understand the future of Dubai. So I now had the private email address of Muhammad Alibar, and I wrote him a little note saying he really understood the essence of the book and what it was designed to accomplish, because it was designed to accomplish a renaissance and an uplift of the Western system, including the Western system wherever it happens to be, including Dubai. So at any rate, I wrote him this note, and I got a note back from his personal assistant yesterday saying that... Um, that when he opened his laptop and saw the email, it made his day. Well, that's terrific. But she also informed me that Mohammed Alibar had named one of his racehorses after the genius of the beast. So there is now a horse running around Arab racetracks, <laughs> <laughs> um, owned by one of the five leading people in the Arab world, um, which is carrying the name of a book by a Zionist atheist Jew. <laughs> Now, if this is not a sign of pluralism in the world, um, oh wait, the makeup department's about to step in here. <laughs> there. Um, if this is not a sign of some sort of breakthrough in the world, at, at, of course, at the same time, the troops that uh, presumably Mohammed uh, Alibar is in favor of are, are stomping out things in a fairly fear ferocious way in Bahrain, although we really don't know what the nature is of this opposition in Bahrain. Um, and the suspicions of the Saudis that it could be an Iranian plant because the opposition is all Shiite and Iran is all Shiite um, could conceivably be accurate. I mean, it could just be paranoia. It could just be propaganda. Um, but it could be accurate. So at any rate, this is, it, it's a weird connection. And meantime, another weird connection happens. Now, this I, I hope that people watching this will forgive the idiotic egomania of all of these stories. Because the next one is even more egomaniacal than a horse running around with a name Beast on its butt somewhere um, in, in Arabia. And presumably it races on European racetracks and God knows where. But at any rate, um, the, the, the next story is about, well, you know, I started in theoretical physics at the age of 10, right? Theoretical physics and microbiology. So what the hell I ended up doing with Michael Jackson and Prince and Bob Marley and Bette Midler and all those people, ACDC, Aerosmith and Kissing Queen, is a whole different question, except that I was looking for the gods inside of us, and the gods inside of us are related to science because science is about truth, and truth is found in the human passions, and the human passions reshape history, and history reshapes the whole froth of intelligence that sits on the 14 or the 13.73 billion years of cosmic evolution and aside from that, there's no connection, right? <laughs> um, so, at any rate, it, after spending all this time in, in, uh, in rock and roll and popular culture and heavy metal and all of that kind of stuff, um, the idea that anybody would ever let me back into the world of science was pretty outrageous. I mean, you know, they take one look at my credentials and they were obviously going to throw me out the door. And especially in my home territory where I started out in the very beginning, which is theoretical physics. I mean, seriously, is, uh, is the world of theoretical physics going to take a guy who spent time with Michael Jackson at all? Seriously? Give me a break. Um, people in theoretical physics are sane, right? <laughs> Okay, so in 19, 2005, I was in the middle of one of those nighttime conversations that you can only have thanks to the Internet, one of those things that goes on from 2 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the morning and takes place on email, and you send an email out, and you get an email back within 10 minutes, and it keeps going back and forth like a ping-pong tournament. 
Um, and it was between myself, a guy named Paul Werbos, who is the program director for computational intelligence of the National Science Foundation, and a guy he had introduced me to named Pavel Karakin in Moscow, who is at the Keldish Institute of Applied Mathematics of the Russian Academy of Science. And, and I also had Nova Spivak, who was the leading person in semantic webs involved in this for a while. But mostly it was me and Pavel going at it hot and heavy, and we were covering really basic topics in theoretical physics, which, as you know, having worked with Michael Jackson, I have absolutely no right to do. Right? Right. Thank you. Um, so nice to hear you agreeing with me, TJ. Now, um, <laughs> So in 2005, Pavel asked me if I would co-write a paper on theoretical physics with him. So we spent six months working on it, and we, we finished it up, and it's about Pavel's theory of inner time, and inner time basically, oh God, can I explain this? Inner time says that there are basically, you know how your stairway has landings, and if you put your foot on the landing, you're perfectly fine, but there's a vertical surface, and the vertical surface is there only to stub your toe, but it's necessary to hold up the next stair. Well, it's as if time is a set of stairs. And in between the landings, in between the flat things that you put your foot on, I'm not sure they're called landings, they're probably called steps. Um, <laughs> in, in between the steps, there's this vertical thing that really doesn't matter you're climbing, but it holds the stairs up, right? Right. Okay. Pavel says that time is made up of these little horizontal stairs, right? But the equivalent to the vertical landings are spaces with no time in them. Spaces with no time in them, in between the steps of time. It's hidden time. It's inner time. And in those spaces with no time, what happens when there's no time? Well, it's the equivalent of infinite time. There's all the time in the world. And I was saying, okay, you've got, let's say you've got a, let's do a little toy universe here with 100 particles. And in the spaces between time, which are infinite, the hundred particles all confer with each other and exchange information in order to decide where they're going to go in the next step of time. Then they all get together and confer again in the space of no time to figure out where they're going to go in the next actual step of time. And let's imagine a universe with a hundred billion particles. Well, it's going to take time for a hundred billion particles to confer in whatever way particles may confer. A lot of time, but hey, guess what? They got a lot of time, because they got these empty slots where there is no time at all, which is the equivalent of infinite time. Okay, so we've got a gossiping cosmos, right? A crazy view. And, of course, you know, my stories of bees, and my stories of bees are one of my favorite stories of how a collective intelligence works and about how things communicate in this universe. And I, I, I propose, I tell the story of the bees in great detail, and I propose that this is at least a useful model to begin with to talk about how all the particles in the universe may confer before they make their next move in the next instant of time. Because you know one thing that happens in the next instant of time is everything moves a little bit. Everything, everywhere moves a little bit. There's no such thing as standing still. The theory of relativity is all about that. Um, at any rate, so we write up this crazy idea about how particles in the universe are like bees conferring with each other in slots of time in which there is no time, which as a consequence have infinite amounts of time. It's got to be a crazy... This is not theoretical physics, TJ. This is Warner Brothers cartoons. <laughs> this is Tom and Jerry. Um, better yet, this is, this is the, the... I don't know, it's Woody Allen and the bees. Um, so we... we Put in this, we, we write this story, and there's this thing called Arxiv Org. And Arxiv Org was founded, I think, by the Santa Fe, and no, it wasn't the Santa Fe Institute, it was follow, founded by Los Alamos National Labs. And it is this very hoity toity online platform for really advanced articles in mathematics and theoretical physics. And it's peer reviewed. You have to have five peers who say it's okay to put this thing up to get onto Arxiv Org. And guess what gets on Arxiv Org? Our paper. And then I got an email from, um, from my partner, from Pavel Karakin in Moscow, saying, hey, on the basis of our paper, we've been invited to give a presentation to speak at an international conference of theoretical physicists in Moscow. Well, TJ, how the hell does a bozo from the land of ACDC Aerosmith Kiss and Queen get an opportunity to get up in front of an audience of theoretical physicists in Moscow and tell them what they should think. Especially with crazy ideas about bees dancing in between the stair steps of time. 
<laughs> this kind of stuff just doesn't happen. Well, it's a return to my childhood. I mean, this is paradise, being able to go back to where you started and, and, and take a step upward. So my partner in Moscow tries to get the funding for it from the government and stuff like that to fly me over there, and we can't get the funding, and I figure, how many opportunities am I going to get to go to Moscow and talk to an international conference of quantum physicists in my life? One. This is it. <laughs> So I sell my cushions, I sell my pillows, I sell my, my, my couch, I, you know, I do everything necessary to scrape up the money to produce a travel budget for myself and my assistant to fly to Moscow so that I can address this conference of international quantum physicists. Well, the day of the presentation that my partner and I are supposed to give, my partner comes to me with bad news. Um, they ran out of time in the session where we're supposed to give our speech, and the next day they'll reschedule us for another time. Well, TJ, I've gone all the way to Moscow. I have sold my couch, my cats, and my dogs in order to get there. I know that if we haven't been given a definite time uh, already for when we're supposed to be, go on, we're likely not to go on at all. And there is no way in hell, having spent all this money getting to Moscow, I am going to give up on my chance to address an international conference of quantum physicists. <laughs> so I sit so I sit in the session uh, in which we were supposed to give our speech. I'm there on schedule, despite the fact that we've been descheduled. And I listen while quantum physicist number one goes up and gives his presentation, while quantum physicist number two goes up and gives his presentation, while quantum physicist number three and number four go up and give their presentation. And TJ, I take in my mind, which normally has no memory whatsoever, I have the memory of a decorticated frog. Um, I take really, really careful notes on what these guys are saying. And I take very careful notes on what the responses are I want to make to what they are saying. I mean, remember, I haven't prepared any speech <laughs> for this event. My partner has not given me any sort of guidance on what it is we're going to say. We have not rehearsed. We have not discussed this. Nothing. I am flying by the seat of my pants at an international conference of quantum physicists in Moscow. So I listen to the first four presenters, and I take very careful notes in my tiny little brain with my decorticated frog memory, my non-memory. And then, now, okay, you have to understand something. I'm used to traveling with just a credit card. I don't carry cash. Who carries cash? Cash is an antique. <laughs> cash is outvoted. Cash, you know, what's cash, for God's sakes? Um, what's a dollar bill? Um, okay, so I travel with my credit card, and my assistant says to me before we leave, well, don't you think we should carry some cash? And I say, look, you don't have to carry cash. Wherever you go, there are hotels, and wherever there's a hotel, they take credit cards, bozo. Well, okay, we get to Moscow, and we discover that the conference is not really in Moscow. It's in this little tiny town 50 miles outside of Moscow. In fact, it's not really even in a little tiny town. It's 10 miles outside the little tiny town. It's in this sort of borscht belt, brick, modern building that looked super modern in the 1960s that was built as a worker's vacation paradise. It's sort of like a dormitory at a college. It was built in the 1960s. And by now, of course, some of the bricks are turning black and there are little holes in the walls and things like that. But aside from that, it looks modern, right? And um, we walk in to where the conference organizers are sitting, um, uh, signing everybody up for the conference and handing them all of the conference materials and stuff like that, and, of course, accepting the money that they're supposed to pay to get into this conference. And I hand over my credit card, and they look at me as if I am trying to pull off a bank heist. <laughs> credit card? What is a credit card? This crazy American is obviously some kind of thief, some kind of con artist trying to put something over on us. So for the next three days, my poor assistant goes into the little tiny town every single day, begging at banks, trying to find some way of turn my, turning my credit card into cash so I can pay these people the cash they expect to get from me in order to let me into this conference, for God's sakes. Now, one guy bullies me over this more than any other person there. He is really, really 
nasty about this. He tries to make me feel like shit, and he does an extremely good job. And his name is Dr. Yuri Uzhikov. Okay, we are back back at the location where four guys have just given their presentations on quantum physics and where I have been bounced from the menu, where I have been bounced from the program. It turns out the last guy on the program is, guess who? Dr. Uri, Yuri Uzhikov. And it turns out that Dr. Yuri Uzhikov is a big shot, a really big shot. And Yuri Uzhikov gives this terrific talk with terrific animations. I really enjoy his talk. I don't expect to, because the guy and I are supposed to hate each other by now. Um, but I enjoy his talk tremendously. And you can tell how important he is, because when he finishes his talk, first there are all the colleagues who ask him questions, but nobody really challenges him. Wait, make up department again. There we go. Um, and, um, and then come the grad students. And the grad student ask, students ask the most brown-nosing questions you have ever heard in your life. Every single one of them is designed to give an injection of silicone to Uzhikov's already puffed-up ego. Um, <laughs> at, which, of course, doesn't have a nipple on it, so the silicone analogy is a little strange. But aside from that, um, and Uzhikov is having a wonderful time on the stage, answering all those questions, being the center of attention, um, having his ideas taken with extreme seriosity, etc. And then there's a silence. All the questions have run out. Not even the grad students have got anything left they can brown nose him with. And Uzhikov is looking dejected. He does not want to leave the stage. He does not want to stop being the center of attention. And I raise my hand. And I say, Dr. Ruzhikov, I'm not really an expert in these things. So can I ask you a few questions? Can I ask, um, can, I, can I give you what I think you were saying, and can you tell me if I was right? Well, Uzhikov beams. He needed more attention. I'm about to give it to him. So I sum up the first quarter of what he said in simple terms that anyone who understands the English language, including a bunch of Russians who don't really understand the English language, should be able to understand. Comic book terms, simple children's coloring book <laughs> terms. Because if you can't understand a complex idea in children's coloring book terms, you don't really understand it, at least in my humble opinion. At any rate, so I sum up the first quarter of what he said, and I throw it to Uzhikov, and I say, did I get that right? Because the odds are I got it all wrong. Remember, I'm not a professional theoretical physicist, even though I've been around this stuff since I was 10. I am not. In fact, I'm equationally illiterate. I am mathematically illiterate. I only understand, I don't understand equations. I only understand math when I put it in pictures and metaphors in my head. Um, so I ask him about the first quarter, and he says, yeah, you got it absolutely right. Okay, then I solve the next quarter. Did I get that right? And Dr. Ruzhikov says, yes, you have that absolutely right, until I finish summing up his entire talk. And apparently, Uzhikov either is trying to be polite to me because I speak English and he doesn't, um, or he's trying, he's saying yes because he doesn't want to confess that he doesn't understand my English, he only understands Russian, or something, but obviously something's wrong here. There's no way I could understand every word that the man said. No way! He's a theoretical physicist! I'm Michael Jackson's publicist! I'm a frog from hell! Um... Okay, when he finishes, he says, you know, we have another 20 minutes here. Does anybody else want to make a presentation? And I immediately leap to the stage and say, yes, I do. Um, and then I go, I, I look at the first person who gave a speech, and I said, now look, if I understood you correctly, I give them a speech on why everything they know about theoretical physics is wrong. I give them a speech on why everything they know about the most basic equation in theoretical physics, Schrodinger's equation is wrong. Schrodinger's equation is the one that says that a particle can be in two places at once. And it doesn't make up its mind about which place it's in until somebody observes it, until somebody measures it. That's the basis of quantum physics. And I'm about to tell them why all of that is wrong. So I look at the first person and I say, look, if I understood you correctly, you said the following. And that means that Schrodinger's equation is not working for you. You just said that you need to use a computer algorithm and the process of laying out a computer program to really understand what's going on with a, an elementary particle. 
you have just said Schrodinger's equation is not cutting it. I need to find another way to, to, to deal with this. And then I turned to number two and said, if I understood you correctly, you just said the following. And that means Schrodinger's equation is wrong because you've just proposed an entirely different approach to grasping the subject. And I do that for all four of the guys in the conference. And then I explain to them, Schrodinger's equation is based on the idea that particles live in isolation, that particles live on their own, that particles can be somewhere in the cosmos where nothing sees them, where nothing measures them, where nothing takes their temperature, where nothing tries to understand them or get to know them. And that isn't true, because there is no such thing as a particle on its own anywhere in this cosmos. Everywhere in this cosmos, gravity, at the very least, reaches. And wherever there's gravity, gravity is communication between particles. Gravity is a way that particles take each other's temperature and give each other instructions on how to move. I'm bigger than you are. You move toward me. No, oh, no. You're bigger than I am, but I want you to move toward me. Bozo, you don't understand the rules of the universe. I'm telling you, I'm bigger than you are. This is gravity. That's two particles talking to each other, for God's sakes, measuring each other in some way. There is no such thing as an either. No particle is an island. No bacteria is an island, no human is an island, no particle is an island. Every particle is, is participating in a social process. It's part of a mass, it's part of a drove, it's part of a herd, it's part of a flock. Um, and so I give them a simple speech about why everything they know about quantum physics is wrong. And I expect them to throw me out of the conference. And they don't. When I'm finished, they sit there and they beam you know, how people's faces redden, and they get smiles, these great big uncontrollable smiles on their faces, and they beam like proud uncles, and I don't understand it. I think they must be joshing me. You know, they must be patronizing me. They must be being nice to me just because I'm this silly American and the only language I can speak is English. And all the rest of them can speak Russian, and I can't. Um, they must be patronizing me because I'm so obviously dumb and ignorant about quantum physics. They must be patronizing me because I don't understand a single equation, except E equals MC squared. That's as far as I can get with equations. So I, I walk away, and I've had this impression for the last five years that uh, somehow they were very nice to me because I was obviously such an ignorant dunce until last week I got an email from Pavel, my partner at the Keldish Institute of Applied Mathematics of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And he says, do you remember Dr. Uzhikov? Well, of course I remember Dr. Uzhikov. Dr. Uzhikov was the one who tried to make me feel like shit. Dr. Uzhikov was the one whose speech I thought was amazing. Um, Dr. Uzhikov was the one whose speech I summed up in 10 minutes. Um, of course I remember Dr. Uzhikov. And he says, Dr. Uzhikov has a book out, and it's in English. It's brand new. And it's available on ArcSivorg. So I go over to ArcSivorg, the site that was founded by Los Alamos National Labs, the site that published his paper and my paper, and I download it immediately, and I scam it. You know, I take it from PDF, and I turn it into a Word document, and I send it to my Kindle, because my Kindle will read me anything on PDF or Word out loud. So for the last four days, I've been walking around listening to Dr. Uzhikov's book, and it's amazing. And now I understand why these guys were beaming like proud uncles. They agreed with everything I said. Everything! And Uzhikov's book is taking all of these ideas and turning them into the next generation of quantum physics. So I write to Uzhikov. I mean, to me, obviously, it's obvious to me that I had no influence on these guys. That couldn't possibly be the case. All I did was manage by some happy accident to come to the same conclusions, 12,500 miles away from them, that they had come to in Russia. Spread out over their 13 time zones, because these are guys from all over the former Soviet Union. Um, so I send Uzhikov an email yesterday, um, because I think Uzhikov's book is frigging terrific. I think his ideas are great, at least so far as I can understand them, because remember, I can't understand the math. I can only come to a kind of metaphorical understanding of it. And um, I send him a, 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 a note, and I say, Dr. Uzhikov, you may not remember me. I'm Pavel Karakin's partner, the guy who only spoke English, who showed up at your conference in 2006, and uh, who made what may have sounded like absolutely absurd and crazy remarks after your speech. And Uzhikov said in an email that I got today, of course I remember you.
didn't you read the first half of the book? Does Ushakov mean I may have influenced him? I mean, at the very least, he means we agree with each other. This is ridiculous! This is frigging phenomenal. And what does this have to do with anything else in the cosmos? Well, I haven't been able to stay on top of my science reading. Yes, I read science news from cover to cover every single week. Um, and yes, I pay attention to various other things as well, but it doesn't really feel like staying on top of science because normally I stay on top of five or six different sources that tell me the same thing from five or six different points of view every single week. So I really know what's happening. I'm really plugged in. And with my computers crashing left and right around me, we've lost all the podcasts. And they have to be reconstructed so that I get the New York Times Tuesday Science Section podcast and the podcast from the New York Academy of Sciences and the podcast from the British Royal Society and all the ones that I'm accustomed to. So I really felt out of it. And tonight, before while I was prepping for tonight's Rip, rip roaring ranting session of Howard the Ask Howard the Humongous. Um, Want to know why? Ask how. Howard the Humongous, as if I know anything, which of course we clearly know I don't. But if we're not going to tell the audience that. Audience, you never heard that. Um, I know everything. Okay, now, um, so I was prepping and I ran across two amazing little articles. And one of the articles is about brain science. And it says that neural cells get together in modular units, like Lego bricks, and they do it based on the nearest neighbor principle. And the nearest neighbor principle means you and I are neurons in a brain, TJ, when the brain is getting its act together. And you and I are checking each other out and deciding whether we should get together. Well, according to traditional psychology and neurobiology, we should get together if we act together. If we act together one or two times, we should strengthen our connections to each other. And the new research says, no, it doesn't just work that way. Yes, that's partially true. But you and I, first of first off, check each other out to see if we have friends in common. And if we have a lot of friends in common, then we get together. If we work together and we have a lot of friends in common, then we get together. Does it sound at all familiar? Does it sound like real life for human beings? Um, certainly sounds like real life to me. So the result of this is that, that neurons get together in little groups of 50. And those little groups of 50 act like Lego blocks. And all the memories and all the perceptions that we have are formed from these little Lego blocks. Well, that's right. You know, I'm writing this book about theoretical physics. I'm going back to my roots. Right now I'm writing about Einstein. The God problem is about theoretical physics, of course, as, as it relates to your life and mine, I hope. But at any rate, and... That's exactly what I'm writing about, Lego blocks. I'm taking things back to 10,000 years ago when humans invented the brick and then invented ways to make walls out of the brick and then invented ways to make apartment complexes out of the walls and then invented ways to make three-room apartments with private rooms for the first time and with straight walls for the first time and with right angles at the corners for the very first time in not just human history but the history of the cosmos because the cosmos doesn't build that way. Things in the cosmos are a lot more wiggly and wobbly. And the brain, it turns out, is building in modular units, and that's what I'm talking about in this book. And that, in a certain way, is what Dr. Uzhikov is talking about. I'm talking about a cosmos that builds based on simple rules, that does what Stephen Wolfram talks about in Cellular Automata, that starts with the, or the simple rules, the rules of the simple rules of the game of life. Cellular Automata. I mean, do you know Cellular Automata in the game of life? Uh, the whole reason I'm not... The whole reason I haven't interjected anything at this point is because uh, I'm not really fit to comment, so I'm just kind of... Oh, well, I'm not fit to comment either, so... <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm considerably less so, so uh, I'm just gonna, I'm just kind of letting you do your thing, because I have no... I'm There's nothing I could conceivably add of any sort of merit to, to what's being said right now. So. Well, well, here's how the game of life works. Imagine a checkerboard. Imagine it on your computer screen. And, and the, it's an empty checkerboard. Now imagine that the squares can either be lit or dark. They can either be dead or alive, right? And you're one of those checkerboard squares. <laughs> I think now, we actually did talk about this before, but you can, oh, okay. so, you can go ahead and okay. summarize it again because it was pretty long ago. Okay, so you're one of those checkerboard squares, and you operate on this simple rule. And the simple rule is, uh, if you're all alone, if you live in isolation, I mean, this sounds like the stuff we're talking about with the, with the cosmos. If you live, all, I mean, you know, no particle is an island. If you live all by yourself, if you are totally solitary, you're dead. So you stay unlit. On the other hand, if you've got company, if three or more squares around you, remember, there's space for eight squares around you, two on this side, 
one on the top, one on the bottom, that's four, and then one at each corner, and you have four corners, so that's a total of eight squares. If three of those squares are lit, you have company. Well, if you have company, you light up, you're alive. But if you have too much company, if you're surrounded on seven or eight sides, the oxygen is sucked out of the room. There's no more room for you. You are crowded out and you die. Those are the rules. And they're simple local rules. Local rules means you respond only to what's happening to the eight squares you're touching. You don't know what's going on on the rest of the checkerboard. You don't even know that there is a rest of the checkerboard. And when you turn this checkerboard on and you start it with a simple pattern, the most amazing things happen. Some patterns disappear immediately, and some patterns, uh, in, by pattern I mean that you fill in a couple of the squares, and then you see what happens. You set the thing in motion. Um, and you set it following the rules. You set the individual cells following their own rules, only knowing what their neighbors are doing. And the most amazing thing is happening when these, when these cells only know what their neighbors are doing and nothing more. These giant patterns begin to emerge, and the patterns have an identity of their own. And even though the cells that, that make them up don't have a clue as to what they're participating in, these patterns go across the screen, leaving one group of cells behind and taking over another group of cells, and somehow imposing this grand architecture of their pattern on many, many cells which have no idea of what they're participating in. None whatsoever. So how the hell does this giant pattern come, to, come into existence? Well, the basic idea, one of the basic ideas in the God problem, is the universe operates the same way. It started off with three or four simple rules. It didn't start off with equations. What universe is crazy enough to even understand equations? It starts off with a couple of simple rules. And then, like the game of life, like cellular automata, it unfolds, and it unfolds into grander and grander patterns. So that, that's what the book is about. And, um, and that, in essence, is what this new research about how the brain works is saying, that the brain works and, uh, and accomplishes all these incredible things, like building laptops and uh, YouTube and, um, and the works of Shakespeare and the works of Jackson Pollock by putting together little modular units modular units that follow simple local rules. So, and the other piece of research that I ran across was research on these, these guys, ones at Michigan State University in Lansing, and, and these guys are in the habit of taking absolutely identical bacterial clones and then letting those bacterial clones develop their own society. We've talked about the fact that literally no bacterium is an island. And if you drop a bacterium into a Petri dish, actually it will not follow the rules of the game of life. In other words, if it finds itself all alone, it won't kill itself and die. If it's got food, it'll do just the opposite. It'll multiply and create a community around itself because it can't stand to be alone. So they let two bacteria start their own colonies by dividing like crazy to make a community so they can be in the middle of a crowd and feel at home. And then they let the communities duke it out against each other. And they discover that the communities that start doing the best, that begin to take over the Petri dish, are the ones that have a big, flashy um, mutation, a big, flashy innovation in their genome, in this long string of genes um, that makes them who they are. Um, and for a while, the guys with the biggest, flashiest innovation take over the Petri dish. And the other guys are crowded to the side. But they just keep on moving ahead. It's the tortoise and the hare. They just keep on having small mutations, tiny little mutations, tiny little innovations, tiny little breakthroughs. And the accumulation of the tiny little breakthroughs eventually makes them much cleverer and much stronger than the guys who had the big flashy innovations. And there's a reason. Because with a lot of tiny cumulative innovations, every innovation is tested to see if it fits. And as the innovations accumulate, all of them fit. And by the time you've got a whole lot of enough innovations to make a really radical breakthrough, all of its parts have been tested. So they all fit. And they all fit into the teamwork of the whole community. They fit the teamwork of the community. And because they fit the teamwork of the community, they work really well. But the big flashy innovations haven't been tested like that. And they don't fit the community structure of the community so well. And eventually, they fall apart. So the ones, the colonies that started with the big flashy mutations end up falling by the wayside eventually. And it's persistence that pays. It's sticking to it, 
generation after generation after generation for tens of thousands of generations until your tiny little changes all pile up. And there's something about that that relates to what's going on in Egypt right now and what relates, relates to what's going on in Algeria right now. Because when the revolutions of um, Gamal Abdel Nasser happened in Egypt in 1952, and the revolution of um, uh, Gaddafi, who imitated Gamal Abdel Nasser, happened in the 1960s. These were strange and foreign ideas being imposed on a local culture. And today, those local cultures have been taking in the ideas of the West for at least 60 years. Um, and they have been getting used to those ideas of the West. And those ideas are about civil are about rights. They're about human rights. And they're about democracy, and they're about individual freedoms. So while the while Nasser and while Gaddafi started out with a big flashy innovation, it didn't fit the structure of their society, and it didn't fit the individuals who formed the team of their society. It didn't fit the, fit the team structure of their society. But the teams have been growing. The people who are alive today and the people who are making the revolutions weren't alive in the days of Gamal Abdel Nasser. They weren't alive in the days of um, uh, Qaddafi's original revolution. They have grown up in the era of television. They have grown up in the era of radio. They have grown up in the era of the internet. Um, and the result, and they have taken in an awful lot of information from the West, and they've been taking it little bit by little bit, and have been making it a part of their own personalities, of their own characters. And in a strange and funny way, these very Western, in fact, very American and very European ideas of democracy and of human rights fit much better in Egypt and presumably in Libya, because we really don't know about Libya, but at least in Egypt. They seem to fit much better today than the ideas of Gamal Abdel Nasser and of Muammar Gaddafi, who, after all, were Arabs and should have understood how to deal with their culture. That's it. That's a little rant that goes everywhere so, uh, from here to bacteria. Here's a question that kind of yeah. pertains to that. Um, you talk about the uh, the two bacterial colonies struggling against one another and then... Uh, kind of likening that to the revolution, and I was, uh, well, the, the multiple revolutions going on in the world right now. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm just reminded uh, of comedian Bill Hicks um, saying, you know, it, it's a round world last I checked. And, I, I mean, all the lines that we have are, are fairly arbitrary, um, although they've been reinforced by existing for generations, well, a lot of them anyway. Um, so why... Why do humans come around to the mentality that murder of civilians anywhere is acceptable or uh, that a natural disaster anywhere uh, can be looked at as, as someone else's problem? I mean, why do, we, uh, why do we still have these rigid divisions and kind of this uh, pseudo-speciation uh, between, you know, the, the, the tribes? Uh, obviously, we're, we're larger than tribes, but we still have a, a lot of that tribal mentality well, uh, there's two different questions. One is the question of why don't we care um, when other humans are dying, and the other is the question of why do we have this tribal mentality, and as you called it, pseudospeciation, which in essence is the explanation um, of why we have it. But um, the qu right now, it doesn't look as if we don't care. In fact, it looks as if the very opposite is happening. It looks as if CNN, which is a global channel, cares a great deal. It looks as if even Pravda, Pravda, by the way, has been saying right from the very beginning about the Libyan revolution, it's all an American plot to take over Libya's oil. Um, none of it is indigenous. It's all the CIA. So we may feel the tremendous sympathy for the revolutionaries, even if we don't have a clue as to what they stand for and what they really want. Um, we're told they want democracy, but remember, the reporters who tell us what's going on don't speak the language and often idealize things. Uh, they're the same guys who told us that uh, there was a great and wonderful revolution that was going to bring us paradise in Russia in St. Petersburg in 1917. That didn't quite turn out to be the case. They're the same press people who told us in 1948 that Mao Zedong was about to bring, to bring a fabulous paradise to China which didn't turn out to be the case. He starved to death over 40 million of his people. Um, so the press is often easily misled by its optimism and its naivete and its inability to understand the language. But one way or the other, the amount of caring about what is going on in Japan 
the amount of caring about what is going on in Haiti, the amount of caring about what went on in the uh, Indonesian uh, tsunami of several years ago, um, the amount of caring going on in the world right now is probably the greatest amount of caring that has ever gone on in the history of the cosmos, literally. Because, remember, empathy and sympathy are relatively new things to this cosmos. Life didn't begin until four billion years ago. Um, and, and empathy, well, we could probably trace that back uh, 200 million years. It's something relatively new. Um, so, at any rate, this is the greatest outpouring of empathy the world has ever seen, and it's enabled by inventions like CNN and Fox TV, um, by inventions like the Internet. Look at the outpouring of caring that went on over the Egyptian revolutions, over the Iranian uh, street demonstrations, over the death of that one girl in Iran who was shot in the demonstrations a year and a half ago. We we do care, TJ. Now, well, we, we uh, you know, I, I agree that there's definitely a large group of people that do care, and I'm 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 among that group. So I mean, I know that it's out there, but I mean, there's also seems to be a fairly sizable number of people who are just like, well, you know, that's what the Japs get for Pearl Harbor, and then you know, there's the people who are like, well. I don't know about this revolution over in uh, in Egypt because um, you know I don't I don't really care about that I don't want my gas prices going higher you know uh, it's it just like you know you for every you know it seems like right now for every person you find that is you know sending out that empathy and compassion you can find at least one other person who's just totally callous and and you know does not give a fuck beyond their own existence or uh, the existence of their particular community. And well, I was about to say uh, that, that the, uh, the split goes on right within you and me, because we are caring people. We pride ourselves on being caring people. Um, but the fact is that at 11.30 at night, when you're wandering around your apartment and you've got the television on and it's in the background and it talks about, um, about a whole bunch of people dying in the tidal waves and the tsunami in Japan, there are moments when you don't care. There are moments, in fact, when you look at yourself and wonder, how could I be so callous? Um, there are moments when you don't give a damn. You're, there are moments when you're just happy that you are alive, and as long as it's them and a long way from us, you're fine with it. And that's even if you're the most caring human in the world. Now, you're not supposed to admit this to anybody, and I'm, supposed to, I'm certainly not supposed to be admitting it either, because I do care. I care a lot. But the fact is, we all have that division down the middle of ourselves, and we all have the good self and the bad self operating simultaneously. And the question, the real big question is the other one that you raised, which is why do we have this, and why do some people file to one side of the divide and care an awful lot and seem to minimize that aspect of themselves that's callous, and why do other people take callousness to the nth degree and seem to minimize to the nth degree that part of themselves that cares? Um, and, and the answer is differentiation. The, the cosmos operates on the basis of differentiation. I mean, at the very beginning, the cosmos differentiated into two opposite forces that were joined to the hip, attraction and repulsion. She differentiated from, from a, a uniform sheet of space and time moving at pretty much a uniform speed. She blipped out and, and precipitated into quarks. Quarks were unique because they had individual identities. And some quarks were up out quarks, and some quarks were down quarks. And if you didn't have this differentiation right from the beginning of the cosmos, the cosmos would never have explored our potential, would never have achieved breakthroughs, would never have created all the incredible things the cosmos creates. So when you get two groups of humans, or you can get one group of humans, and they go into the luscious, most wonderful, most paradisal valley in the world, um, and they settle down, and then they begin to quarrel, and they split into two groups, and one group says, screw you, we're going up into the mountains and we're going to raise goats. And the other group says, screw you, we're going to stay in the valley and we're going to raise cows that live on the grass in the valley. And the hill people say, oh, those crappy people down in the valley, they're evil. They're evil because they raise cows and because they live in the valley. And the valley people look up the people in the hills and go, oh, those guys are evil. They're yahoos. They're, they're monsters. Uh, look at them. They raise goats. What kind of decent human being would raise goats? Um, and then they decide to take a bunch of stones and, and clobber each other's brains out, although not entirely, because usually they take the women and screw them for all they're worth and then take them home as sex slaves until, of course, the women have babies, and then whichever winning, whatever, whatever side wins gets the most babies. But it's through these competitions, which we have turned into creative competitions. You know, we don't clobber the Japanese, um, at least we haven't since World War II, 
we don't clobber them. Instead, we compete with them. You know, we try to sell them General Motors cars, and they try to sell us Toyotas and Hondas. Well, at the moment, they're doing a lot better. <laughs> they do. They're, they're a little better at that at this point. Uh, yes, assuming they can still make I, their I, Toyota. I, I, I did want to. I did want to kind of ask you about something that has to do with this: uh, the whole cultural difference. And this is something I've seen uh, several people point out: is uh, there was no real problem with looting in Japan. Uh, there, there might have been some looters. I'm sure there were, but there weren't. Uh, there weren't enough for it to be uh, a problem, and I know that in America, if there's a disaster, there, there's some looting. I mean, I, I went through Katrina, and I saw that stuff firsthand, and I know how people get in uh, a disaster situation. Um, and I was wondering if this is because I, I was kind of positing a bunch of different explanations for myself, and I'll go through all the explanations that I came up with, and then you tell me if you got anything better. Okay. Because first I was thinking maybe it's because we're more individualistic and, and the Japanese tend to be more collectivist. So it, maybe it has and, and something to do with a lot of, like lot of validity the, that. we're we're kind of like oh yeah you know I got to look out for me. The Japanese are, are more like okay we got to look out for our culture and you know we all have to cooperate. And then I thought maybe it has to do with our different attitudes towards corporations because I know that in America we love a corporate scandal. I don't know if you know this or not, but in uh, in Japan, if uh, if a Japanese newspaper is writing about a corporate scandal, they never use the word corruption. They almost always use the word mistake. Aha. Uh -huh. So I, I thought it might have to do with more reverence, because I know that in America, you know, I don't know anyone who thinks it's morally equivalent to steal from a a, a large, you know, a corporation as it is to steal from a person or a small business. Um, so, I mean, I thought maybe that might have something to do with it. And then my the last thing I was thinking about was maybe it just has to do with that that Japanese sense of dignity. Because Amer I know I'm not saying dignity isn't important to Americans, but it does seem like that's that's lower on the totem of importance to us. We're more we're a little bit more pragmatic in some ways. Uh, uh, in, in a nation with Jersey Boys and reality TV, indignity <laughs> seems to be a highly prized. Very highly prized. Um, I think all your explanations have validity. A, a, a culture at heart uh, is a set of elements, and those elements include an infrastructure of habit. And the infra it includes an infrastructure of habit, and it includes a worldview, a way of looking at the world. Well, the Japanese infrastructure of habit is one of duty. Your, your duty is to the group. The, the group is what prevails. The group is the most important identity around. The group is that large-scale structure on the game of life that incorporates each of us as one of its individual elements. And the Japanese are very, and their identity, their pride, comes from the group. Um, when a Japanese person hands you his business card, the it, it isn't his name that is featured on it. It's his company's name that's featured on it. Then the next thing that's featured is his position in the company, because the position is more important than he is. The position will last even when he is gone. And the last thing on it is his name, because the group is the entity that counts the most. And when you are in a calamity, your obligation is to maintain the group intact. And if that means that your sense of duty, that your Bushido-like honor, means giving up your life on behalf of the group at that very moment, fine. If it means that uh, you're in a nuclear plant that is so irradiated that you will probably die sometime in the next five days because of the radiation, but you are part of a group that prides itself on the fact that it has been running nuclear plants for the last 15 to 20 years, and your entire sense of group identity comes from your willingness to sacrifice yourself in order to keep those nuclear plants going and to keep them safe and to protect other people, then you will glad, more gladly die on behalf of the group that you are a part of and that larger identity that you contribute to, then you will live because you would live in shame. There was an amazing, there were two amazing pieces of video footage over the last few weeks. One of them explained Muammar Gaddafi in a second. And it was Muammar Gaddafi giving a speech when it really looked like he was over. He was over and out. The international community had turned against him. It looked like his people had gotten him cornered. And he was trying to give a gesture, a victory gesture like this, and he was so conscious of the epaulets on his shoulders and not ruffling them too much that instead of going like this, he went like this. <laughs> it was so limp that it was ridiculous. It was so half-assed 
that it was absurd. And do you know what happened the minute he finished with his obviously lame-o speech, one of the biggest failures of his career? A bunch of guys rushed up to him. Well, actually, one officer in particular rushed up to him and kissed his cheeks, and kissed his cheeks with a body language that said, I'm scared shitless of this guy. I've got to kiss his ass every minute or he could slit my fucking throat. So you saw in the body language of that minute that Gaddafi can get away with anything and people will kiss his ass. That he is surrounded by a little intimate circle that has been kissing his ass for something like 42 years. That he is as divorced from reality as he is because he keeps that kiss-ass circle around him. Now, something that's relevant but irrelevant here, back in the days when I used to lecture people like John Mellencamp on how to handle stardom, I would try to explain to them one of the most dangerous things that can happen to you is when you really become successful. People will crowd around you just wanting to have any piece that they can of your power and your money. And as a consequence, they will tell you anything that you want to hear. So if you want to hear that your farts smell delicious and that the flavor should be marketed by a chocolate company, you will hear that. You will hear that. And nobody will dare come up to you and say, John, these chocolates smell like fart. And that's one of the most dangerous things can happen, that can happen to you, because when you cease having people around you who are honest with you, you lose your connection with reality entirely. You're off in bubble land. Well, none of the stars that I ever worked with were off in bubble land. Even though Michael Jackson was talked about as being off in bubble land, he wasn't. He really was in touch with reality. Muammar Gaddafi, on the other hand, is off in bubble land. Except he's got a lot of money, and he's got a lot of ammunition, and he has, been, he has managed to give his troops a taste of victory. And if we don't stop him real fast, like sometime in the next half hour, because we are doing this conversation on Friday morning, um, and actually he could have won already in Benghazi, um, if we don't stop him real fast, we're in big trouble. Now, the other gesture that told something vital about the infrastructure of habit and the the picture of the invisible world, the worldview of another culture, was in Japan. It was the day that the earthquake struck, and a, the entire roof of a shopping um, a, a supermarket had fallen in, and it looked like a great big piece of tarpaulin um, laying across the floor. And there were 30 people who had survived unscathed um, the earthquake. And those 30 people were gathered around that great big tarp as if it were a great big net, like the nets that you see that, that, that the, they used to carry in the old days to, to catch people when they, when they flung themselves out of burning buildings. These giant nets like you see in Dumbo, the Disney movie. Um, these 30 people were gathered around that tarp as if they had been an organized team all their lives, as if they had always known each other, and they were saying, the Japanese equivalent of one, two, three, heave. And they were all heaving together to lift that piece of roofing to try to save anybody who might be underneath who still might be alive. Now, the chances of anybody being alive looked minimal because that roof was no further than an inch from the floor if it was that far. I mean, anybody under there would have been crushed, and they were still working their tail off. Why? Why were they working their tail off to save other human beings? Because they'd been raised not with a sense of rights, which is what we focus on in the West, they've been raised with a sense of obligation. They've been raised with a sense of duty. And that duty to them is more important than rights. Well, you need a balance between duty and rights. We need that in America. One day, it was 1991, it was the uh, day of the Rodney King riots in L.A. And for whatever strange reason, I may have told you this story before, I decided, I, you know, I had been sick in bed since 1988, so for three years. But somehow I had managed by working up, by walking 20 feet a day, then 40 feet a day, then 60 feet a day, to get to the point where I could walk six miles. And that only lasted about two months. But while it lasted, I was nauseous, I was too weak to speak. But while that lasted, the day of the Rodney King riots, I went up to Harlem to see what was going on. I took a subway up to 157th Street and then walked downtown from 157th Street straight through Harlem just to see what was happening. And in the 1960s, when there were riots of that kind, when there was a riot in one city, there was a riot in every city. They were universal. Well, in Harlem, 
things were just the opposite. The streets were, it was like a ghost town. Nobody dared go out on the street. Nobody wanted to trigger the kind of violence that they had in L.A. They could have gone out on the street. They could have looted. They could have imitated the riots in L.A. They did nothing of the sort, nothing whatsoever. And those streets were eerily, eerily quiet, with the exception of drug, uh, of people who were so drugged out that they couldn't get up off the sidewalk, and people who were so alcoholed off, out that they were literally just babbling on the stoops of houses. But those people were at a minimum. So there is a balance in society between duty and obligation on the one hand and freedom and, and liberty and rights on the other hand. And it is a vital obligation to, it's a, I mean, it's a vital balance to maintain. It's as vital a balance as the balance between your tensor muscles and your extensor muscles. We've probably talked about this before. Opposites joined to the hip. So if we were to cut the muscle on the top of your bicep, your hand would be stuck out straight for the rest of your life. You'd never be able to move it again. And if we were to cut the muscle on the bottom, your hand would be like this for the rest of your life, and you'd never be able to move it again. But if you've got the two operating in balance with each other, you can move your hand pretty much wherever you want. You can lift up weights of up to God knows. It depends on how, how heavy the weights are that you've been lifting. Um, but at any rate, the balance, things are about balance. It's not an either-or proposition. It's a both. And what we can learn from the Japanese is the importance of obligation and duty. And what we can learn from the Germans, one thing to be very aware of in this really uh, rocking boat of an economy, which may go into a second dip, a double dip, um, because of what's happened in Japan. In, in this economic downturn, Germany has done well. Germany, in fact, while the Japanese were busy eating America's socks, Germany was becoming the world's leading exporting nation, a, a greater exporting nation than Japan itself. Um, today, China is the world's greatest exporting nation, but guess who's number two? Germany. Germany, with its social welfare system and its short work weeks and its long vacations and all that crazy nonsense, all that crazy bullshit is outdoing us and outdoing most of the Asian nations as an exporting nation. And Germany has something in common with Japan. There was a reason that Japan and Germany got together during World War II. Not only are they both very racist nations, um, but they both have a tremendous sense of obligation and duty. What can we learn from them? The fact that obligation and duty allows you to accomplish things of stunning value just don't get too far into it. Don't let it take over. Don't let it go to an extreme. Balance it with, with rights and individualism. Does that make any sense? I'm sorry I'm preaching here. <laughs> uh, it makes sense to me. I can't speak for anyone else, though. Well, all right, well, it's, uh, and, and hopefully I don't say the same damn thing in every single one of these Howard Dumongas <laughs> episodes. Um, but, all right, what else is on your mind, TJ? Um... I did want to kind of ask. Um, I mean, it'd be I'd be remiss if we didn't uh, talk at least uh, somewhat about the the whole nuclear power situation. Um, the um, I, I don't know. I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm I've pretty much been a supporter of nuclear power, and uh, I think that this incident has kind of been covered the wrong way when it comes to that. Because um, I mean, for, for I mean, to for, for the plants to be doing this well after that level of disaster. You were talking about like a 9.0 earthquake and a, a, a series of tsunamis, not to mention all the aftershocks and uh, these we're plants still going on today. These plants have hold they, these plants have held up remarkably well under those circumstances and I mean I any power plant pretty much is going to have uh, some sort of, you know, negative re repercussion under those circumstances. And actually if the diesel generators had been built higher up, it might not even uh, I mean, I, no one can say for sure, but we might not have had anywhere near this level of disaster. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of nuclear power, and I, I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of saddened by the fact that I think it'll, it'll be, get an even worse rap after, uh, after this, which I don't think is deserved because, um, I think they've held up pretty well considering the circumstances. Well, the total, in all probability, nobody knows what exactly the total number of deaths is, um, but in all probability, at least 10,000 people have been killed by the earthquake and the tsunami, at least. Um, how many people have been killed so far by nuclear disaster in Japan in the last week? None that I know of. 
No, none that we know of. Uh, there are probably about five people who have been irradiated to the point where they may die within the next two years. I mean, those 50 guys working in the power plant um, under extreme circumstances where there have been, in all probability, cracks in containment vessels, um, where there have been uh, spent fuel rods in cooling pools that have run out of water, um, where the heat is beyond belief, um, those guys are being exposed to levels of radiation that are lethal. Um, but if a total of 15 people die because of uh, nuclear, the nuclear aspect of this, and 15,000 people die because of the natural aspect of this, what do we conclude about how kind nature is versus how kind technology is? <laughs> yeah, that that's kind of uh, kind of goes along with my thinking on this. Now, I really am not in favor of nuclear stuff. It scares me. Um, because I was raised in the days when we had to hide our heads under our desks and put our hands over the backs of our necks um, to practice what we would do if a nuclear blast came, as if um, hiding under our desks and putting our hands behind our neck was going to save us from a nuclear bomb. Um, oh, it, it, it totally would. They can't oh, get past desks. Everyone knows that. Yes, well, so at any rate, so this nuclear stuff scares me, but here is one thing to contemplate. Um, three... We've had three really big headline accidents this year. One was the mine disaster in Chile. Now, that mine disaster was in a metal mine, but the same thing happens actually in coal mines all the time. Um, uh, roughly 200 people die a month in China in mine disasters. That figure could be off by 50 plus or minus here or there, but it's the right ballpark. Um, and we had... The three mile, uh, we had the, the, the um, BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, um, which was fairly hideous. And now we've got this potential nuclear disaster, which reminds us that if nukes really get out of control, we could have nuclear poisoning in the environment, I mean, in the, in the stratosphere, that would go on for years and years and years um, that, could, that could devastate life on the face of this planet. What does this indicate? Well, usually... Um, ask a question of a guy whose only tool is a hammer, and he'll answer the problem in terms of nails, right? Right. So what's the hammer with which I answer every problem? Why, harvesting solar power in space, of course. So to me, this is an argument for a carbon-free source um, that is non-polluting, um, that doesn't uh, put a crimp in the earth, that doesn't run uh, heavy-duty risks, like the risks of mining disasters and the risks of oil pollution of an entire sea, like the Gulf of Mexico, um, and it doesn't involve the potential of polluting the entire atmosphere with nuclear waste that would destroy life. Not all life, because bacteria can handle nuclear waste very nicely. Thank you. Fine. Thank you very much. And But we at least need the alternative of this energy source that is endless, for God's sakes and gets us up there in space with a foothold up there where the resources are infinite and life needs to go anyway. And if we don't take it there, who's going to take it there? But you've heard this from me a million times. So it's trying to kind of bring out the hook and shoot me in the head, for God's sakes. <laughs> so that's, my, that's my time. You know, I love technology. But I love that there are two different kinds of technologies on this planet. And one is the kind of technology that gives us increased personal control. And we are so addicted to that kind of technology that we spend so much money on these little things that give us nothing but an illusion of personal control called automobiles that it's ridiculous. Look how much we spend to buy them, eighteen to $48,000 or more, just to purchase the damn thing. I mean, it takes some people a year to make that much money. And then look how much we put into maintaining them. I mean, anybody who's got a car that doesn't go into the shop every three months for $250 per, per episode is extremely lucky. And then look how much it costs to keep them in gasoline. And, and we pay, why do we pay this outrageous amount of money? We could simply jump on a train and read a book um, or talk to people um, because it gives us a sense of personal control. I mean, even though we're stuck in traffic doing two miles an hour, for an hour and a half each way, every day, that's three hours total. We have our own hands on the steering wheel, for God's sakes. We have our own feet on the pedal. Who's got the feet on the pedal and the hands on the steering wheel on a train, for God's sakes? Not us. Or a plane, for God's sakes? Not us. So we're willing to pay out 
outrageous amounts of money, like giving away pounds and pounds of flesh in order to gain that illusion of personal control. And then there are technologies that don't give us that sense of personal control. And nuclear technology is one of them. Electrical technology is not really one of them because we got iPads. I mean, look at all the money we spent for iPads, iPods, cell phones, and all the rest. Those are things that give us a sense of personal control. Laptops, I mean, the amount of money I spend on this new laptop when all my computers crashed was enough money to buy a small house, for God's sakes. Um, <laughs> or a used car, for that matter. But I live my life on my laptop, and it gives me control all the time. I can control the mouse. I can control the keyboard. Um, I can turn up the volume and turn down the volume. And that sense of control, you know the, 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 the stuff that's in my books, all of the research on the biology of control. When we have an illusion of control, it boosts our immune system. It boosts the functioning of our perceptual system. All of a sudden, we're bright and alert about life, and we feel good. And when we lose that sense of control, our immune system goes into a nosedive, and we become, uh, we become susceptible to colds and viruses and all kinds of terrible things, and our brain goes fuzzy, and we have a hard time thinking. So that sense of control, the need for the sense of control, is not just some arbitrary thing that we consumerist Westerners came up with. It's built into our freaking biology, and it's built into the biology of mice and dogs and all kinds of other creatures. And believe me, they don't know a thing about Western society creating consumerism. <clears throat> I, um, I, I guess that, that kind of that, that brings up an interesting... Uh question is um you know when we get to like right now um you know pretty much anyone could get the materials together to build a bomb and get the instructions on how to do that um you know they're, they're on the internet they're the materials are available at fucking walmart for fuck's sake um i wonder about a point in time when our technology is sufficiently advanced that anyone could build a bomb that could destroy an entire city or an entire planet even conceivably uh how does i i always wonder how if that were to happen does uh, does humanity survive something like that it's a good question because when 9 11 happened there's something i probably have described before and it's something almost impossible to describe in words um the day of 9 11 that whole sense of the infrastructure of habit that holds a civilization together, that makes us individual cells on that game board of the game of life and parts of a bigger picture, something bigger than we can even see, um, all those infrastructure of habits fell away. And somehow when they fell away, all of a sudden you realize they were there, and you'd never realized they were there before. And you realize that there's this invisible fabric that holds together a nation that holds together a civilization, that holds together an economy, that holds together everything that we're used to in life, because we get everything we have from other human beings. We get our food from other human beings, we get our mattresses from other human beings, we get our clothes from other human beings, we get everything um, from other human beings. And with it, when that fabric that pulls humans together into an enterprise that allows them to nurture each other and, nur and nourish each other every single day falls apart, whammo, you're going to have humans starving by the zillions, um, by the tens of millions. And if a bomb, you don't need a bomb to go off in a city and devastate a city. All you really need is a dirty bomb in the middle of Manhattan, my city, um, to poison a part of the city, to poison a significant enough portion of Midtown that property values go down, that people start to flee the city, that people lose their confidence in being in the city, that people no longer want to be here, they want to flee to the countryside. Because the day of 9-11, I was getting calls from friends saying, I should flee to the hills of Kentucky, shouldn't I? And all of a sudden, I realized, if I don't explain to this person why he needs to stay in New York, New York is going to die. And there are only seven cities like New York on the face of this globe, and they are the eyes and ears of humanity. If the eyes and ears go, the whole thing goes dark. Blind men don't do very well finding their way across a landscape. And these cities are the eyes and ears of civilization, mankind, and as a consequence of the cosmos, because, you know, mankind is the only consciousness the cosmos has got. Um... So, but people were ready to leave this city, and if people start leaving the cities, and again, if property values go down, and if companies will no longer locate in these cities, then all that froth and yeast that comes from cities is going to go. And if you look at research on the number of innovations that come from cities, 
versus the number of innovations that come from suburbs or the number of innovations that come from the countryside, the innovations are all coming from the cities. Very few are coming from the countryside. So humanity is going to go brain dead if these cities die. And it doesn't take an entire bomb. It doesn't take a nuclear bomb to wipe out an entire city to do it. It just takes enough to destroy the infrastructure of habit that makes a city and the fabric of a nation function. Well, yeah, I mean, if you look at um, my uh, my favorite probably case study and something like that was uh, the D.C. sniper a few years back, you know, uh, who basically shut down an entire economy just by killing people at random. I, I don't know what his final tally was. I think it was something like 19 people. Yeah, it was somewhere in the 14 to 20 range. Yeah, and, and uh, it, it, you know, just statistically very unlikely to, to fall prey to this guy, but because it was random, it filled people with uh, tremendous fear, and they were afraid to leave their houses, and the entire economy of, a, of an entire city suffered because of the actions of one crazy guy who wasn't even trying to accomplish that, and yet, nonetheless, he did. Well, the um, first of all, one of the uh, people quoted, one of the Japanese quoted, in the wake of this catastrophe, um, said that the reason that the nuclear situation is so terrifying is because um, the tsunami and the earthquake were the past. And the nuclear problem is the future. In other words, one is already out of the way, it's predictable, we know what its scope was. Uh, but the other one, we have no idea of what its scope is whatsoever. And Mohammed, who was the master of empire building, absolutely the master, to go over the statistics for the millionth time in this series, uh, Mohammed put together, or he at least laid the foundation for an empire unlike anything the world has ever seen. It's an empire that was 11 times the size of the conquests of Alexander the Great, five times the size of the Roman Empire. That's the size of five Roman empires, and the Roman Empire is the biggest the West has ever been able to achieve, with the exception of the English Empire, which lasted a flick in time. Um, and uh, Muhammad's empire, that is the Empire of Islam, the empire that grew up in the 150 years after Muhammad's death, um, was also seven times the size of the United States. This is an astonishing thing to put together. And to go over another little fact, Carolyn Elkin from Harvard University, who bills herself as the world's leading historian on imperialism, says about imperialism, there's one thing that's true about every empire that has ever been. No empire in the history of the world has ever been able to win the hearts and minds of the people it conquered. That is totally false. Um, if, you find, if you go to the people that Islam conquered in Algeria, and uh, ask them what their religion is today, it's Islam. If you go to the people that um, Islam conquered 13,500 miles away in Aceh, Indonesia, or in Malaysia, and ask them what their religion is, it's Islam. So Muhammad knew something about how to glue people together successfully. And he knew something about how to yank people out of their previous social structure and glue them into a new social structure. And do you know what his glue was? No. I don't. <laughs> terror. His glue was terror. He understood the value of terror in totally unsettling you and totally removing you from any infrastructure of habit you had previously accepted and fad had made a part of the fabric of your being and inserting people into a new infrastructure of habit. Because to avoid terror, people will do things that they won't do for any other reason. To avoid uncertainty and the uncertainty of not knowing when they are going to die, not knowing how they are going to suffer, not knowing how they are going to be tortured. People will beg and plead, they will get on their knees, and they will offer anything to avoid uh, a fate that they consider worse than death. And Muhammad knew that, and he preached that as a part of warfare. Terrorize the shit out of them. Terrorize the fuck out of them. Terrorize them till they're crapping in their pants. Kill and kill and kill until you instill a terror so deep that people will crawl on their knees and volunteer to do anything in order to get out from under the terror. That's when people will give up everything. Everything in their lives. Everything they've known. Every belief system. Every infrastructure of habit. And will take on your infrastructure of habit. Your belief system and will adhere to the authority that you wield over them. So terror is an extraordinarily powerful social glue, among other things. It's an incredibly powerful social dissolvent, solvent, social dissolver, 
And it's also an incredibly powerful social glue if you know how to use it. And Muhammad knew how to use it better than anybody else in the history of humanity that I know of. Which brings up the question is, what do you think of the Peter King thing? The Peter King's um, um, anti-Islam crusade or whatever it is, trying to get at uh, the nature of radicalization in the Islamic community in the United States. I haven't heard about it, so I couldn't really comment. Yeah, and I haven't heard about it either. I just see the headlines, and I see people complaining and saying, "Well, shouldn't we be um, uh, shouldn't we be looking into radicalization in every religion?" And I think that's bullshit, because the radicalization in Islam is very special, and it's very different from radicalization in Christianity, and it's very difficult from the, different from the militia movements. And yes, back in the 1980s when the militia movements were getting violent and we're talking about nuking half the country so the other half of the country could be the new white Aryan Cayman, um, it was worth uh, investigating them. But that's not what we're up against right now. What we're up against is uh, Islam. And mixing the two up is mixing apples and oranges. They're two very different belief systems. And if you don't focus on each belief system, you'll never understand what in the world they're talking about and why they're dangerous and why and, and how you can carry them to in the positive direction. I mean, you know, not every Christian uh, wants to nuke half the country to have the new Aryan Canaan. Uh, there are people called Methodists and Unitarians, for God's sakes. Um, and the question is how to have more Methodists and Unitarians, and it was in the 1980s, and how to have fewer of these militia groups. And the question right now is who are the peaceful Muslims? Why are they, who are the pluralist, tolerant Muslims? Are they allowed to speak out within their own communities? Because there's a lot of policing that goes on within Muslim communities in the United States that we're not allowed to talk about, we're not allowed to know about. And those things are worth knowing about. So Peter King may be a bloody racist, for all I know. I don't have a clue. I haven't watched any of his hearings. I haven't read any of the transcripts. All I've seen are the headlines. But I think that the headlines are taking um, the necessity of probing Islamic militants, uh, militancy very much less seriously than my friends in the Muslim community who feel oppressed by militant Islam are 